Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, this morning's webcast, Applying Open Fair to Analyze Risk in a Retail Environment. I'm Jim Hightower with the Open Group. I'll be uh, hosting the event today, um, and I'll be talking very briefly at the start, just giving an introduction to Open Fair, the Risk Taxonomy Standard, and the Risk Analysis Standard. I'll be followed by Jim May and Bill Estrom from Metaplexity, who will be talking about using Open Fair to analyze risk in a retail environment. The uh, risk, the material that we're going to be covering today in the the analysis piece is based upon two standards that were introduced by the Open Group: the Risk Taxonomy Standard, which you see uh, a graphic of here. Um, this is a standard that we published uh, four years ago now and, and did a revision last year uh, that looks at. Uh, how you how you decompose risk into into its uh, constituent parts, looking at loss event frequency and probable loss magnitude. Um, so I'd encourage you, if you've not seen the risk taxonomy standard, to get a copy of it from our website. Uh, it's free for uh, for folks to download from the Open Group Publications page. Uh, the companion standard to the taxonomy standard is called the risk analysis standard. Uh, and it adds a set of best practices around doing a risk analysis uh, to complement what's in the taxonomy. It covers such things as how to do a fair-based risk analysis, measurement and calibration, the risk analysis process, uh, and some basic control considerations. Uh, so those two pieces really comprise the, the body of knowledge for the open group uh, certification program around this, which is called the uh, open fair certification program very briefly. So it's a certification based on your knowledge of fair based risk analysis uh, requires that you take and pass an exam. Um, we have uh, a number of trainers that are in the midst of accrediting their training courses. Uh, it's suggested that you do take a course, but uh, it's not required that you do. Uh, you can learn the materials just by studying the two standards uh, sufficiently to pass the exam. Um, so that's the, the open fair certification. Uh, currently, there's just the foundation level to it, and we are working on an, a more advanced level for the certification that we'll probably introduce late this year. Uh, and just a little bit about the exam. It's, it is available at Prometric Test Centers. It's uh, an 80-question test that you have 120 minutes to, to take. Um, it's, uh, it is a supervised exam with a pass mark of 70%. Uh, and then finally, uh, some links to the some of the things that I've, I just talked about. So the uh, taxonomy standard is available at that URL. The risk analysis standard is there as well. And then we have a couple of web pages on the risk certification program. If you're looking for more in, if you're looking for more information on those. All right. Well, welcome to the webinar. So the objective of this presentation today is to really kind of show how the uh, open fair risk analysis standard can be used uh, to analyze information risk. And I think we've picked a uh, fairly uh, timely topic here, uh, considering some of the things that are going on these days in the retail environment with, uh, with credit card capture. And so we're using a, a scenario that'll talk about some of the issues related to, uh, to that type of threat. Um, so we'll take a look at a real threat scenario uh, that's based on uh, some uh, information that's been published on the web, and uh, we've kind of come up with our own version of that scenario that uh, will analyze the risk factors that are involved. And uh, we'll also mention briefly some of the things about the Open Fair Certification Program. I think Jim already covered it pretty well. So, yeah, my name is Bill Estrom. I'm the president of Metaplexity. Uh, I've been involved with the Open Group since uh, 1994. Uh, when it was first started. I've uh, been working heavily with the Enterprise Architecture Forum uh, with the development of COGAF and more recently Archimate and FAIR. And um, I'm a past chair of the Architecture Forum, served on the Open Group Governing Board. Uh, Metaplexity as a company focuses on training and consulting services related to enterprise architecture. Well, <clears throat> I divide my time between Windsor Software and Metaplex and Associates. Um, I'm one of Bill's guys who does some of the training. We recently got into a project with the folks at the Open Group to put together a curriculum for the FAIR certification training activities. And uh, parts of what we're doing today is based upon the material that we've submitted and, and uh, the Open Group will be publishing. 
Uh, we also recently, on the uh, uh, Windsor software side of things, put together a book called Building Enterprise Architecture, which is a series of approaches to maximizing the use of architecture in the organization. Because we, we like TOGAF over on the Windsor software side of the world. So we're going to be talking here about uh, the open fair standard and how it compares to some of the other risk management approaches out there. There's a lot of similarities and some differences. So basically, when we take a look at, at most risk management frameworks that are out there, and there are several, uh, we find that uh, they're trying to mitigate risk uh, by using techniques like risk classification, identification. Uh, we typically talk about the initial or inherent risk assessment when you're looking at the uh, kind of the baseline pre-intervention risks and then the risk mitigations and resulting residual risks that need to be uh, examined. And then uh, basically once we get the system under control, we can then move into a monitoring and governance approach. So yeah, there are two different levels of risk, as I just mentioned, uh, the inherent risk or initial risk, as some frameworks call it, uh, which is basically the categorization that you have uh, when you're basically just beginning to look at the analysis and looking at the factors that are currently there. So prior to any uh, mitigating actions. And then after you've implemented the mitigating actions and any risks that remain to be managed um, are basically called the residual risk. So a typical process that's followed is uh, this this set of steps here is very similar to the steps that are listed in the TOGAF Enterprise Architecture Framework uh, for risk management, but you can look at project management frameworks and other, other frameworks and they pretty much follow the same techniques. So the first thing we try and do is classify the risks in terms of the, the nature of the risks. Then we identify a specific risk and uh, we then perform an initial risk assessment. We're just trying to figure out you know, what are the current risks that we're facing. Then we try and come up with some strategies, some mitigations, and then we basically do the residual risk assessment and go into a risk monitoring mode. So very similar to what we just described a minute ago. Go ahead. And we'll come up with some kind of a, a model that kind of allows us to classify the severity of the risks that we're facing. So if we have risks that are uh, frequent and, uh, and high magnitude uh, catastrophic events, then I would say that's an extremely high risk, uh, all the way down to risks that are a negligible impact or effect and unlikely to occur would be considered uh, low, low risk. And so each company can really determine their own um, risk framework in terms of uh, how they classify different events and what level they assign to different uh, things in terms of catastrophic or, or high levels, things like that. And then you can have some kind of a table that you can use to just kind of keep track of uh, risks. So here we have a credit card data loss and uh, the effect obviously for a company and for its customers would be critical. Uh, right now we seem to be in an environment where this is becoming a fairly frequent event and the impact is extremely high. So the mitigation would be to implement a set of security practices, and, uh, and then we would hope to, by doing so, uh, drive down the frequency and uh, hopefully also reduce the, the effect to a marginal level, which would then uh, make it a lower risk or low risk. That would be the goal. So basically, once these residual risks have been identified that still cannot be managed, uh, some frameworks, like for example, TOGAP, uh, recommend that uh, your governing uh, group for your enterprise architecture or IT governance uh, organization uh, should basically uh, take on those residual risks, approve them, and uh, make sure that they are being properly uh, managed. And the mitigations should be carefully monitored to make sure that the enterprise is dealing with, with residual risks rather than than uh, only fixing the initial apparent risks. So the open fair standard, as Jim already pointed out, uh, is composed of two parts. We've got the uh, risk analysis standard, which gives you a method for doing risk analysis, and then the risk taxonomy, which basically defines the term and provides a structural model for the uh, risk analysis framework. So together, those two standards are the body of knowledge we call open fair. And as you look, you can kind of see the different areas we're trying to manage here. We've got various types of threats that are out there. 
Uh, we talk about several different types of threats in the fair standard. We have assets that we're trying to protect in order to minimize losses, and we then have a set of controls that we can implement that will help us to do that. So again, the open fair standard defines risk as the probable frequency and magnitude of future loss. So we're dealing here with probability, not just possibility. I mean, it's possible just about anything can happen. But here we're talking about a numeric uh, um, a measurement of the probability of an event occurring. So yeah, nearly anything in, in life is possible, but uh, we try and, and make it uh, so that we can actually do a quantitative analysis of the probability uh, rather than just the possibility. So on the open and fair standard, uh, we'll see that we follow basically a four-step approach. Uh, the first stage is to identify the scenario components, and you'll see the model for this. Uh, actually, Jim already showed you a, a basic model of the open fair taxonomy. Uh, so you'll see how we populate that. Uh, basically, the two major components of the taxonomy are the loss event frequency. That's the stage two analysis. And stage three is to evaluate the loss magnitude. And then based on those two factors, we can derive and articulate the risk in the final stage. And this can be repeated uh, for several different risk scenarios. So you don't just do just one threat. You might actually have in a typical scenario or a typical risk analysis, you might actually analyze multiple uh, threat scenarios to try and get some kind of an aggregate idea of the amount of risk that you're facing. Um, what we're about to walk through is a condensed version of what we've done as the case study that we use in the training that we do. So our case study is called the Unfaithful Contractor. Uh, this would normally be woven in in segments in the training. It's a two-day course. And <clears throat> what we do is we base this on the overall taxonomy. In doing this, because we have the ability to, because it's a hypothetical, we have the opportunity to create uh, uh, transit of the main factors at the lowest level, the contact frequency, and you see them along the bottom here, contact frequency, probability of action, threat capability, resistance strength, asset loss factors, threat loss factors, the organization and external loss factors. And we populate a model, uh, and we show how to populate and do the estimates in it. So today we'll do a slightly abbreviated version of that. And we'll be open to questions as uh, we go along, post your questions. We'll try and get to as many as we can when we're done. So in this case study example, we're starting out with a real threat with some ability to estimate loss, event frequency, and a semi-real loss, a simulated loss with some possibility of estimating loss magnitude. It all starts out with an inquiry from management. Dan Johnson, the third CEO and owner, calls and asks whether it is possible that the store systems can be hacked like ATM machines. Of course, you think hacked, but you don't think so. But me, before you reply, you say, well, why the concern? You're the risk manager in this organization in this scenario, so you get the uh, come up with answers for stuff like this, but Dan, of course, is a CEO, so he says he saw a speaker at the Civic Club's monthly luncheon talking about security. He brought it up. It sounded serious. Can you look into it? Well, as the risk manager, obviously, you know the difference between the thing on the left and the thing on the right. He said something about an ATM, but the nearest thing to an ATM in the store would be a device like this, so you do a little bit of research, and again, because he's a CEO, EO, you're probably going to have to do a little bit more research just to be a good guy. You like to help them out a little bit, maybe even help them understand the difference. Well, along the way, you get the Krebs on security and you see this. Uh oh. What is that? This is uh, straight off of Krebs on security. It happened, we got posted on December 2nd. We've got Brian Krebs' permission to use this as part of our training. And what looks like a little bit of cell phone video shows a shell being removed from the top of a very commonly used uh, card reader. So we might have a threat. Now what? 
Mr. Johnson also asked two questions. What are the chances this might affect us? And what's it going to cost us if it does? On stage one, when we set up this scenario, we try and figure out what are all the factors that are going to be possibly interrogated in an analysis like this. And it can include quite a wide variety of different areas of, of inquiry. The store is a group of stores. There's about 40 stores in the chain. They're regional. They do all for $5. Uh, they have stores, store staff, management, point-of-sale systems, things like that. The store exists in an actual environment that is a community of, of users and competitors and things like that. The store is hoping to you know, open four more new stores in the next couple of years. It's all, um, it is all uh, privately owned, and uh, so we have some factors in there that uh, might be worth considering in the event a loss occurs. In stage one, the outputs that we're going to create will be the asset at risk. We need to identify, we need to say what that is. And we can look at risk, but the risk ends up becoming this completely blurry problem until you get a focus on the asset, and then you can start taking a look at the things connected to that asset, uh, related to that asset, associated with that asset. We also look at the threat communities. Who might actually be this threat? Who are these? people involved, and then the loss event, what's it look like? So in the case of the scenario we put together here, we said, well, we've got some facts here. A threat, threat of uh, credit card information by the point of sale skinner, skimmer. Um, we're going to say, in this case, is contracted service personnel doing the work uh, that caused this. They're placing and removing it. They're, they're, they come into the store. They do their regular maintenance on the equipment. And uh, maybe they drop the shell on top of a leader once and then come back 30 days later in their normal maintenance cycle and remove it. Um, in and out, data has to be harvested. Since you're removing the device, you're going to have to harvest the data and you're going to have to do something to complete an exploit. And uh, some feeds and speeds, maybe 140 customers a day for checkout lane using credit cards uh, as their transaction choice. And cards is a mix of credit debit cards, which are commonly understood, and then what we call uh, electronic benefit transfer cards. That's a United States um, form of card where uh, people get a direct payment for social programs from the federal government through the card. And that has extra regulatory requirements in order to be able to accept those. So there's some interesting possibilities here. So at the, the, in terms of the outputs at stage one, there's a lot more detail that would normally go into this, but we're we're doing this for time's sake. We say the asset is the point of sale systems that that shell sits upon, and then of course the all of the elements in this all scenario radiate from a certain point. And this is the probably the furthest point that the company actually owns. Uh, there there are other assets involved. Uh, there's the credit card number, which is an asset held by the bank that does the, the clearing of the transactions, and you have a relationship with the credit card clearance organizations and obligations that are related to that. But the, the one thing you own is the POS system, and so that's just a an arbitrary choice. And the loss event is theft with exploitation of credit card data by POS skimmer. Theft with exploitation, that means that something actually has to happen with someone's credit card number. Uh, simple theft may or may not be the fullest extent of the loss. So what we want to be able to do is we want to come up with a scenario and we want to evaluate a scenario that has a fairly full exploitation in it. The threat communities would be an extended chain of persons, beginning with a contracted point of sale maintenance staff, all the way through the people who ex exploit the fraud. If they're not showing up for work and doing their part of it, then the full exploit doesn't occur. So we have to develop some understanding or have some estimate of what their capabilities are as well. Otherwise, we don't have a fully uh, realized exploit. Moving forward to stage two, we start with our essentially a series of comparisons. We're going to evaluate a series of factors. <laughs> and these are probability factors. We say what's the probable threat event frequency, and that's based upon the contact frequency and the probability of action, which we'll talk about very briefly. We talk about the vulnerabilities. So the threats and the vulnerabilities uh, oppose each other to resolve into a loss event frequency, which you see at the top there. 
And vulnerability is based upon the capability of the threat. Uh, are they strong? Are they weak? Are they random in their capabilities? And are they, is there enough resistance strength to resist at least some of these threats? Now, what we're doing as we do this is we're looking down the left side of the taxonomy. The loss magnitude is grayed out on the right side over there. And what we'll be doing in stage two is we're trying to come up with some frequency. Risk is expressed to reiterate what we said about risk earlier. Is it's, it's a two-factor expression. The first factor is actually the loss event frequency. That's how often something might happen in terms of a loss event, and that's expressed as a frequency with a usually a range of probability from a low to a high, most likely. And then loss magnitude is a generally a financially um, numerated it's dollars or euros or whatever you've got, and that would be the loss magnitude is expressed as a financial loss, and it's got a low and a high and a most likely figure and uh, uh, some kind of an expression of confidence. So risk never really gets turned into some amalgam of numbers that have to do with loss frequency and loss magnitude. Risk is expressed as those two numbers in, in fair. So to get to loss event frequency, we make a series of what might be considered paired comparisons. We compare contact frequency and probability of action. We also do a comparison or association between threat capability and resistance strength to come up with vulnerability. And in our shortened version of this, we talk about, as an example, we look at loss event frequency. Well, how often might a threat make contact with an asset in question? We call that the contact frequency. And then how often might that threat actually take action once contact is made? Uh, threats can very often, in a retail environment, enter the environment and do nothing or m not take action for a variety of reasons. There may be controls in place, and there may be other uh, reasons uh, why it doesn't seem obvious to the threat that something might need to, might be an opportunity to exploit. So there are a lot of reasons why that might they might not take action. So it's this combination of the, the frequency of the threat arising and then the probability that they'll take action that actually gets resolved into the threat event frequency. And, and here we would be looking at in terms of contact frequency, we won't do threat event frequency. It's, or the, uh, we won't do the uh, probability of action. We'll just do the contact frequency for this one. A uh, dishonest technician working has a shell. They only have the one in their bag because that's all they could afford. They got it on eBay or where they get the skimmer shells. 30 days to all time to capture the card numbers. Uh, they're exclusively working for the $5 store, so every time the exploit happens, it's going to happen to that store. They have normal leave, holidays, and vacations. And now Open Fair works with time bound ex estimates. So, what we're going to try and figure out in this one is you get to choose all what your time binding is in this, but we're going to say a year. That's typical. How many times in a year would they repeat this threat? So you'd come up with a rationalization. In this case, to document what we did, what we said about our, our assumptions are, we say the scenario assumes a single dishonest employee with a single card skimmer device. The employee is generally assigned to a small group among the $48.5 stores. They work exclusively on this contract. They get time off for leave, vacation, holidays. They may be in the store more often than once a month if other the work is being done. They may be in the store more less often if they're reassigned, sick, or other issues come up. And here's where this goes. As we're doing the documentation, we come up with an estimate of contact frequency, and we said minimum six times a year, most likely about 11 times a year because they're going vacation don't like leaving things like that behind on the vacation, maximum possibly 14 times a year. And that would be probably a shorter time in a particular store. And the con confidence, we know they're assigned to the contract because we did a little research. We looked into this to see what the likelihood was. We looked at our contract and possibly contracted the con contacted the contractor. So we have our rationale. We've written it down and we've included it. So we not only have the numbers, uh, we have a, a rationale behind the numbers associated with it. We keep this stuff together. We're beginning to build the case, and we're beginning to build the, the rationale. Probability of action, uh, we've skipped, but minimum, most 20% shot that the person would take action when they walk in the store with this shell. 
most likely about 70%. They know the store systems. They know where the cameras are. They know the managers in the back room. They're in the store, possibly outside of store hours, so there aren't employees watching them. So unless somebody happens to walk up on them that's a store employee, they've got a shot at getting it done. Maximum probability, 90% shot that they'll get that uh, reader shell placed. And, of course, we also are looking at the retrieval side of that as well. Confidence, pretty high. We think that we're pretty sure that the uh, the guy's going to have enough eyes that they on their head they're going to be able to look around. They're going to be able to tell when it's safe to snap something like that in place. As you saw, it was very quick to remove that shell. Um, and that's one of the things we know based upon actually looking at the thing being placed or removed. So at stage two, the other side of threat is, is loss even frequency. We know we want to compare threats and we want to compare the, um, we want to understand the key threat capability versus resistance strength to understand vulnerability. So we say we've, we've figured out how often the threats are coming up. Now we're going to see how often the vulnerability might arise. So we, to do that, we say, what's it take to convert a threat into a loss? Threat capability, the actual capability, is more than simply coming in and, as you see here, in probability of action, dropping the, the shell and even retrieving it because there's a chain of events that need to happen. We have to think about what the, the chain of events is, and we need to document that. So the threat capability may not necessarily be as great as the probability of action. It's usually something less. So what might present, prevent a loss in the scenario, that is, and that's that resistance strength. That's the cameras. That's the people. That's the possible modifications to the shell. You might be able to put some little bumpy things on the shell, little bedazzled uh, uh, jewels or something on there that actually deform the shell enough that that shell wouldn't, wouldn't seat on top of it. Um, how likely is it that all the steps will align and this loss will actually occur is called vulnerability, and that is the comparison of the threat capability and then that resistance strength, the strength to resist the capability of the threat. And when we document it, we would have a rationalization. In the case of threat capability, the rationalization might be for the threat to be fully realized, they must sell the data, and the consequence must ensue. A chain of actions by a group of actors must run to completion, and that means, again, capability is lower than the probability of simply taking action. Vulnerability factors are then documented using minimum, most likely, maximum, and degree of confidence. And we say it's got to be, you have to sell the data, consequence must ensue, and so forth. And then the resistive strength or the resistance strength is uh, minimum, maybe 20%, most likely about 60%. Again, having to do with the fact that the person understands the store operations and has a sense for when to take action, the resistant, resistance strength might be pretty low. In our fuller version of this, we pointed out that the store does a regular rotation on the uh, video um, that they do in the store. So the, the video at the till gets rotate it out once a month. Uh, the tape's going to back up and uh, uh, tapes are erased and reused because it's a privately owned organization and they're cheap. So they reuse those tapes, uh, which means you might get the placement on video, but you may not necessarily get the retrieval or you might get the opposite. You might get the retrieval without a placement. So some of the video might be incomplete as well. So the maximum strength could hit 80% of the managers out there jazzing with the guy and talking to him a little bit during the whole time he's working or, you know, they're sharing a couple cups of coffee and just shooting the breeze. That, that might actually serve as a, a resistive false, uh, capability. So with that, we have a sense for how vulnerable we might be, but now it's time to figure out is vulnerable to what. Um, we understand the frequency that losses might occur. Let's now figure out what loss magnitude means. And loss magnitude in FAIR means, the open FAIR standard means two things. It's going to mean something to do with the primary loss, and that has to do with the loss that would occur any time any kind of a, a loss actually occurs. There's always going to be some loss that's likely to occur. Secondary loss doesn't always occur, and we'll talk about that as we get to it in a few more slides. Primary loss, though, is the day-to-day. -day, uh, these are the things that need to be fixed in the event that a loss occurs. 
And it occur it, it falls into a series of categories, productivity, response, replacement, fines and judgments that might occur, competitive advantage and reputation loss. And these are the categories that are part of the open fair standard. Your interpretation of them may be a little bit open in terms of how your organization would use them. But having some kind of a re- common set of categories like this is useful because as an analyst, uh, there can be, you develop an organization-wide common meaning for some of these things, and it becomes part of your thorough due diligence as you do your analysis. So this is pretty useful stuff. We'll skip to the replacement loss just as an example. Primary loss magnitude can be substantial if it involves replacement of all the store card scanner devices at $668 a pop. And I went and looked up the price of that device. This is a small retailer. They don't get big-time discounts like all the real big-time retailers get. So it's $668 each. And that's a burden cost. That's going to include the installation to get it on site. Hopefully, you wouldn't use the contractor you're already using because they're, they, they might be a problem. But at, at this amount, it's not wildly expensive. The stores will stock about one and a half to two devices per lane to assure enough redundancy at the store level to increase times. And then a lower cost alternative to replacing the equipment might be possible. So let's say we've discovered that a loss happened. We need to do something in terms of replacement. Again, we might be able to glue uh, fancy colored lumps and jewels and things like that on top of them or uh, an emblem with the store logo or something that just deforms the shell enough that that, that layover shell doesn't can't be attached to it. So there may be some possibilities here instead of having to replace it. Now, the possibility may evaporate, and I'll talk about that when we get the secondary loss. So we've got uh, a series of different kinds of things. And one of the loss factors we had to this competitive advantage, unless the secondary loss occurs or something larger happens, things like this, um, your competitive advantage with respect to you and your the other uh, organizations you compete with may be relatively uh, stable. You may not have any issues unless for some reason they discover it, unless for some reason they exploit the fact that something happened and unless, in fact, somebody actually cares. And if you've cleared this up and nobody's credit card ends up becoming compromised, uh, this may be as close to a non-event as possible. And perhaps you found the shell laying on top of the device and recovered it before any uh, data could be sold, but you don't always know that. So uh, that's where some of these issues come in. So here we... We go with some of the primary loss magnitude factors. We have a minimum, most likely maximum, and a degree of confidence. And you can see the replacement cost at maximum could get to about a quarter of a million dollars in the event that something like this is found. So you imagine you walk into the store and you find one of these funny-looking shelves just laying on top of your card reader. How many times does this happen? What do you need to do in terms of the response? This is one of your bigger management questions at this moment. And... The rationale about what needs to be done um, is laid out here. It includes the labor necessary to um, address the primary loss as it has occurred. And because we don't know exactly how far this loss extends, uh, we might have to do some of these maximum things in order to to properly address the and remediate the issue. Now, we have something else. This is just the primary cleanup. Uh, sometimes things get out of hand, and it really depends on the successful sale of data and a, and a, subsequent, a subsequent exploit. And it may vary depending upon the type of transaction. Card exploit has one average value. Debit cards may have a higher average exploit or a different. And EBT might be much lower depending upon who's attempting that step. Um, things with pins obviously end up becoming less likely to exploit unless, uh, as you saw on the scanner on the, on the shell, it was capturing pins, which it was. But at the very least, the secondary loss event frequency here is estimated to be the overall loss event frequency minus about a 10% chance that you might get lucky and not have a problem. So there's a 90% chance that this is going to become a secondary loss. Now, to become a secondary loss, and what we're talking about is we're talking about people who aren't um, 
they're sta- they are stakeholders in the, this overall thing, but they're not necessarily uh, stakeholders who are employees of the all for five stores. Uh, they would be the customers. They would be part of that extended stakeholder population uh, that could be affected by this. And that gets pretty big. And because it gets pretty big, the secondary loss can get pretty big. So similar factors exist. But when we start to really expand it, we start to find out some very substantial sorts of losses can occur. And in this case, one of the ones that happens in our perfectly crafted scenario because we had the latitude to do so, this scenario says a secondary substantial loss may occur because of reputation again. Um, the news gets out that the credit cards have been exploited and it gets into the news media and uh, the store is struggling to address it and they're doing an honest job of trying to remediate this problem, but they've got a problem and uh, the problem has now become a um, both a political and an image problem. And we mentioned earlier that they're going to open four new stores. So uh, the company is privately owned. So from a reputation standpoint in, in America, we would probably look at an organization's market capitalization in terms of their shareholder, uh, their share price, and their value to shareholders. The company in this case is privately owned and self-capitalized. They don't have any issues with obtaining capital. They don't have any issues with their market uh, value. The primary owners are all family. They've got no plans for bringing in any outside stakeholders. So there's no creditors to satisfy, no stakeholders or shareholders to worry about. But the store is uh, hoping for four new stores in the next year or so, and they're awaiting city council approvals and locations where they're going to do the store build, and they're going to need approval before construction begins. Now, in America, we have this famous movie called uh, The uh, (coughs) Blazing Saddles. And one of the funny scenes in it is where Mel Brooks is the governor of the state, and he starts to say, he brings in all of his closest aides, and he says, harumph, harumph, we need to take care of this, we need to take care of this, harumph. And he looks around, and he points at a guy, and he says, I didn't get a harumph out of that guy. Politics gets this way sometimes, and one of the things that can happen is those four new stores could go back a year, they could go back two years, the company is very ethically driven. They're not going to play bribe and kickback games. If and we don't know that the city councils are into that or anything. But the reality is they want to play the game straight, and they're not going to fool around. And they're very clean operators. And they just might have to go away. Those stores aren't going to open. So what you've got is you've actually got an impact on the overall bottom line of the organization simply through reputation loss of up to $1.6 million for a $150 skimmer being placed on top of a of a card reader and then an exploit happening. So things like this can re- really rapidly spiral out of control. But at this point, <clears throat> we have a lot of numbers. We have a lot of what we would consider reasonably good estimates of minimums, most likely a maximum Dollar amounts and probabilities, we've got some confidence in them. We've got medium, high, or whatever level of confidence we can properly uh, summon here. But right now, all we've got is a lot of numbers, and we've got uh, some confidence, and we've got some rationale behind the numbers that explains it. It's In in stage four, we, we derive and articulate the risk. We've got all these distributions of information. We've got all the min, max, high confidence. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm going to take a moment to turn. I'm going to go on mute for just a moment and take a look. There we go. We have um, a series of distributions and ugly curves here that have to do with the estimates that we came up with earlier. And we're doing a series of comparisons to do a derived uh, estimate of risks. And obviously, again, on the left side, we've got the probability that something might happen as a distribution, and we've got a, a probability that the uh, of loss uh, as a distribution uh, on the right. And in this case, we used a piece of software and we created an analysis. This is the answer to the question that Mr. Johnson will probably 
probably be asking, how likely is this to happen? How big might our risk or our exposure be? For Mr. Johnson's sake, the first answer is we look in the lower left corner, we've got the color red, the risk is high, the loss exposure is a million or above. That might be the only answer that Mr. Johnson's looking for. Then again, he might say, whoa, what is this all about? Tell me more. What are we, what's our situation here? The primary loss is relatively low, and we see it in the table in the top right. We also see it in the chart in the top left corner. You see that blue distribution of probable primary loss. We have a fairly likely loss event frequency uh, about eight times a year or thereabouts, and you see it in both charts. And we've got a distribution of losses that doesn't peak much more. Uh, it goes up to uh, less than $100,000. At very max, it's just over 100000 But then all of a sudden, this is a log scale. You see the red splotch, which is the secondary loss. And we have secondary loss not occurring quite as often as primary loss. And that's why the secondary loss is slightly to the left in the chart on the top left. It's slightly to the left of the blue in the primary loss. Um, but that's pretty likely to happen, and it's unfortunately awfully close to the primary loss. The news gets to you that you had um, credit card exploits and then you have customers affected by it. That's considered the secondary loss. Those are the, that's the extended family of stakeholders, and this is the loss that's likely to be incurred. And these are the organizational losses to the all for $5 stores. This is not specifically include um, the loss to those secondary stakeholders, that is, the the customers. So this is a pretty ugly loss for the the company and probably an even uglier loss for the extended family of stakeholders that are involved here. So this is how this would look. It's actually a series of things that have been put together for the purpose of this presentation. You probably wouldn't present it this way to management. And that rounds out the basic analysis in our abbreviated version. <clears throat> we say, I think we can give this back to Bill for, uh, for our summing up here. I'm going to go on mute, and if Bill wants to go off of mute, we can have him do some summary work right here. Slide. No, I heard the word slide. Yeah, would you take it back one slide? Yeah, I just wanted to say a little bit more about this. Uh, this uh, analysis software that we're using is uh, some software that was provided by CXOware. It's called Fair IQ, and it is pretty much this version of it is only intended for training purposes. But I wanted to point out here that uh, the way the software works is by essentially taking the parameters that we've entered into the into the framework here and then doing what's called a Monte Carlo analysis, where it basically repeatedly tries different permutations of the data. Uh, and through this, this particular case, we're doing 3,000 iterations. So what you're seeing over here on the, on the left-hand side, uh, the uh, chart that shows these two little clouds, that represents kind of a scatter plot of the primary and the secondary losses that were calculated in each of these iterations. So that's a key idea that's used in the open fair standard is this idea of using the Monte Carlo analysis to basically estimate the probable uh, values uh, through different combinations of the uh, of the variables that were added. So, and then you see over here also a plot that shows the uh, uh, distribution in terms of the cumulative risk exposure and um, and a histogram that just shows the likely uh, Human of distributions of uh, events. Okay, uh, going back to the summary itself. Um, so, as we mentioned at the very beginning, uh, according to the Open Fair Standard, um, risk is the probable frequency and magnitude of future loss. And so that's really what we're trying to do here. Open Fair is a standard for analyzing information risk. And um, so there's certainly other frameworks out there that can be used for doing risk analysis, and uh, OpenFAIR is not intended to compete with them. Uh, OpenFAIR is intended to be complementary to those 
types of standards. So somebody was asking me earlier if this was a, uh, a replacement for COSO or, or something like that. And obviously, you know, COSO is looking more at financial risk. Uh, you have also the PMI has its own risk management framework. Uh, TOGAP has its own. So there's several different organizations that have risk analysis frameworks. And so I don't think open fair is intended to replace any of them. I think it's intended to be used where it's appropriate. Uh, next slide, Jim. So we've, uh, you skipped one slide. Thank you. So basically we've looked at, you know, some of the common risk methods. Um, some analytical frameworks are possibility driven. They use more of a, um, an approach where you're not only looking at empirical data, but you're also allowing the analyst to have uh, subjective interpretations and um, limited quantities of data where you're measuring uh, the nominal values of things and resulting in, in ordinal uh, estimates. Uh, Open Fair tries to do more of a probability driven approach where you're using the actual uh, estimated uh, outcomes uh, without a lot of subjective weighting. Uh, it gives you an analytical framework that allows you to apply these variables and uh, make it iterative comparisons using that one parallel method that we were just talking about. Okay, Jim. So as uh, Jim Hightala mentioned earlier, uh, Open Fair Foundation certification is currently available. We're working on developing the certified level, or what I think would be called certified level. It's typically the case. And if you wish to get certified, uh, you can certainly contact the Open Group and, and Jim for more information. Uh, the Open Group website uh, has information about Open Fair certification. Uh, you definitely just have to take the exam and uh, you can either self-study uh, or you can go ahead and uh, uh, take a training course. Once you get certified, uh, the current uh, program there is uh, does not uh, expire. So you get certified under Open Fair Foundation right now, that'll remain in effect. There are no CEUs or any other types of uh, uh, credits you need to earn or annual maintenance fees that have to be paid in order to maintain your certification. Okay. So at this point, Jim, I'd like to um, give the floor back to you. And if you want to leave the Q&A section, we'd be glad to answer some questions. Great. Thanks, Bill. And thanks, Jim, for, <clears throat> for the presentations. Um, yeah, happy to, to uh, post some questions and, and uh, get your reaction and answers. Um, to expand a little bit on the uh, question about, you know, is FAIR a replacement for other risk frameworks? Um, you, you know, we, we, we see it as a, uh, a, a solution really for doing risk analysis uh, in a way that's complementary to, uh, you know, COSO ERM, which is mentioned, but other risk frameworks, things like ISO 27005. Uh, in fact, it's worth mentioning that the Open Group published a couple of years ago now a white paper that's really a cookbook that shows how do you take um, Open Fair and the risk taxonomy standard and plug it into an ISO 27005 risk management framework. Um, and uh, that's been a very useful thing. Actually, one of our members, a large aerospace company, uh, had the need to use FAIR and uh, uh, to uh, put it in the context of ISO 27005 and led the development of that white paper. So you can find that out on the Open Group website. Uh, and we're open to doing other other such mapping white papers. Uh, in fact, one of the, the uh, attendees at a recent FAIR course uh, wanted to, to submit something he had done that maps uh, FAIR yeah. to COBIT, and so uh, we're looking at bringing that in and, and publishing it as a white paper as well. <coughs> Generally, uh, you know, the FAIR methodology is a, uh, a way to do risk analysis in a, in a way that can be easily communicated to senior management that's probabilistic, as Bill and Jim mentioned, um, and it really uh, goes a lot deeper than many of the, the higher-level risk frameworks that are out there. Um, let's see what other questions we have here. So uh, we can make a uh, copy of the slides available. We'll do that. Uh, we'll send those around uh, to everyone who's attended the, the webcast. Um, somebody's asking about uh, explaining more about how to read or interpret the chart or graph results. So, Jim, if you're controlling the slides, you might want to flip back to uh, 
kind of the summary graph slide, and and if one of you want to talk a little bit to how to uh, interpret or, or read those results, that would be great. Yeah, the uh, the general output here, the look of it is following along what might typically be a Monte Carlo analysis. And like I said, it's actually got a bunch of stuff all clustered together. This is actually clipped out of a PDF that's generated by the software. So I don't know if you can see my pointers. Jim, are you able to see my pointer? Yeah, we can see it, Jim. All right. So right here, this is a, this is in a graphical format, primary risk and secondary risk. Again, secondary risk is a risk that may or may not occur depending upon uh, the event itself and the likelihood of it occurring. So secondary risk is a little behind primary risk in most of these analyses. This is a logarithmic scale, as you see, and this is a, a simple default of the software. It wouldn't necessarily have to be this way, but it, it helps see things a little bit better. Um, distribution here is being shown in terms of a loss event frequency in a fairly narrow bandwidth. So what we have is a situation we have a number of uh, identifiers within um, FAIR that help characterize this sort of a uh, distribution. But uh, it, this is showing that it's a fairly likely probability as we go right to left here. It shows that the pro even though it's fairly likely to happen, it's got a fairly tall distribution of, of loss. So even in the primary loss, this thing could go from something relatively small. As you notice, here it's below $1,000 to remediate. That's the part where because you're the awful $5 store, you tell people to go in the back and decorate the daylights out of their uh, point-of-sale equipment so that something like this can't be placed upon there. Um, you know, you, you identified this as a threat. You went into the stores. You took a look at the equipment that was in there. You determined that no shells were present at the time because you saw this on Krebs, then maybe all you did was do the modifications and uh, the communications cost and the cost of the little uh, uh, bedazzling designs or whatever you call them um, is right there. Um, if you really get into a more expensive response, so you do something more elaborate, or you um, extend your video capabilities in the store or something like that, there may be some additional remediation costs up here. <clears throat> so that's that's why the distribution looks the way it does. When you get into a secondary loss, it's probably going to be a little bit more around like this. You've got uh, a range of probabilities of secondary loss repair, then you've got a range of costs, and they do tend to get pretty high. And that just has to do with the nature of secondary loss, where the extended family of people out there who are stakeholders in this uh, are affected. This is, uh, as Bill was saying, a, a scatter plot based on the 3,000 iterations that we that were done. This is student software, if you will. It isn't as many iterations as you normally would do. It is based upon those numbers that we saw in our earlier. Uh, tables of information. So what it's doing is it's taking samples out of these numbers here in the secondary loss I'm showing, and then it's doing some things to estimate what the shape of the curve is that is associated with that, and it's pulling samples out of this, and it's using them as part of the components when it does a roll up of um, risk. So to get to the primary uh, loss event frequency and then to get to the primary loss and the secondary loss. Are we over answering this question at this point? Anybody want to hold up their hand? Um, yeah, I think we're breaking We can go into that. this. I mean, yeah, if people want to call and talk to us about it, we can go into quite a bit more about how this works. Yeah, there's a couple okay. more questions. Yeah, so one, one question, uh, and I'll go ahead and take it, uh, relates to um, how does this relate to SABSA's view of risk? Um, and I, you know, having done a fair amount of work with uh, the SABSA Institute and with John Sherwood uh, in in the open group, um, uh, I would say that uh, on the the uh, the side of uh, you know the way SABSA treats risk uh, that looks at uh, security risk, um, the, the possibility of negative things happening, um, 
you know, I think that there's some alignment and, you know, this, this is really a way to, to get a more precise measurement of risk uh, or more accurate measurement of risk, um, you know, given, given a, a, a certain risk scenario. Uh, there is a notion in SABSA of a positive view of risk that, that really isn't encompassed in FAIR um, that looks at, uh, you know, really the opportunity side. So you, sometimes you, in business, you take a risk in order to achieve a benefit and, uh, that SABSA concept, um, you know, certainly applies in, uh, you know, in the broader risk context, uh, but isn't really addressed in, in FAIR. You know, FAIR really is looking at just doing a good job of measuring um, those possible negative consequences and what the, uh, you know, what the impact of those will be. Um, so, you know, I guess that's how I would answer that. I should also mention that there is uh, – a fair amount of work going on uh, in the open group uh, be between the architecture forum and the security forum uh, to to bring risk and security into TOGAF in a more meaningful way. Uh, and uh, there's a high degree of activity around uh, getting the next version of TOGAF, whatever it'll be called and whenever it comes out, uh, to, to more fundamentally address risk and security as you develop enterprise architecture. Uh, There's a question here about <clears throat> how does uh, inherent risk and residual risk apply uh, for using FAIR. Well, I think in this particular case example, uh, it's, we're looking at pretty much the inherent risk uh, before mitigations have been applied. And uh, But we're kind of saying if we did apply some mitigation like Jim was proposing in terms of uh, changing the covers so that, they, that a, uh, a sleeve could not be applied, uh, then that would be then you'd be looking at your residual risk of the main after that. So there's still some other way that they could do that. So I think it could be used in both situations, really. And there's another question down here about is there any evidence that FAIR has been used and successful uh, in real life? I can't give you specific um, data about that. Uh, I just know that I've been working with uh, two large clients recently uh, that have been using the FAIR uh, framework. Uh, in their own risk analysis practices, and I'm sure and that's just a very small sample size. So I do see large organizations using it, um, and I don't need you're asking here if it's better than just old risk matrices. I, I can't uh, respond to that. I don't know exactly what you mean, but I, I think you know, definitely uh, FAIR does use uh, matrices. Um, we, we combine these factors together. And you can put them into matrices, but uh, I'm not sure if that's what you're referring to or not. And then there's another question here about the COVID paper being published. Uh, Jim, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, I, I would expect, given our um, time frames to do these sorts of things, that, that that's probably something that comes out maybe in uh, Q4 of this year. Okay. And you know, stay tuned to the open group uh, risk web pages and – uh, there should be some notice of it when it comes out. Right. And uh, so that's, uh, I think, all we have time for we're at the yep. end of our time. We're right at the end. And uh, so thank you, Jim and Bill, for uh, for participating. And thank you all for for uh, tuning into the webcast. And, uh, you know, uh, stay tuned. We'll have more webcasts coming up on the topic of risk uh, over, over the rest of this year. Take care, everyone.